in a manner of speaking. A monthly podcast on the spoken word. Episode 18, July 2019, Speaking and Singing, a conversation with Jeremy Fisher and Julianne Kayes. Hello, Paul Meyer here with my latest podcast, a service of paulmeyer.com, where you'll find all my books, ebooks, and services for spoken word training and coaching. I've just taken my very first trip to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. We were in Hyannis, near the famous Kennedy Compound, It was a great trip with the family. We saw where the pilgrims landed in 1620, first near today's province town and finally on the mainland at Plymouth Rock. Heard the wonderful accents on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Visited all the little villages named for the English villages back home that I know so well. Truro, Yarmouth, Falmouth, Chatham. Towns whose names are part of my dialectal DNA. Collecting all the great accents. A local advised us to get our groceries from the Star Market. She pronounced it so differently from the general American Star Market or the original pronunciation of the pilgrims, Star Market. A few episodes ago, I started a recurring feature, Guess That Accent. Last time, I played this clip and challenged you to say where on the planet the speaker grew up. Well, here's the story for you. Sarah Perry was a veterinary nurse who had been working daily at an old zoo in a deserted district of the territory. So she was very happy to start a new job at a superb private practice in North Square near the Duke Street Tower. If you guessed France, well done. It was. Ideas, France 14. The speaker was born and raised in Versailles, just outside Paris. To hear the whole recording, search for France 14 at dialectsarchive.com, the home of the International Dialects of English Archive. Now, here's this month's challenge. Where did this speaker spend her formative years? Before I know it, I think it was like in about three or six months, I was speaking English. So I went to my school one day, I said to my counsellor, I can now speak English, can you please put me in English classes? And he said, you are speaking. How did you do that? I said, I know how to get it. So anyway, <laughs> so I spoke English and then they, they were able to put me in regular classes. Get the answer next time on In a Manner of Speaking. So my guests this month are Jeremy Fisher and Julianne Kaye, celebrated founders of the very successful Vocal Process. Please read all about them on the In a Manner of Speaking homepage at palmeye.com. So the three of us have very similar practices in some way, but mine is all devoted to the speaking voice and yours is pretty much devoted to singing. So when I say we're going to explore the boundary between speaking and singing, that seems very profitable. But what does that, what does that idea conjure up for the two of you? Such a, a great question, because obviously it's the same mechanism, Paul. And I don't know, if we have a think about what, vocal sound is we've got pitch and we've got volume and timbre Mm -hmm. and we've got pace as well haven't we when we're we're talking about prosody and speech actually we've got all of those things in singing voice as well yeah a couple of them are a little more developed or used a lot more the rhythmic element is much more obvious and the duration element is more obvious yeah and i think it's the duration element of music that really takes us further away because we have sustain in singing and that means that the the color of the voice and whether there's a uh, real control over the pitch what we hear is the note it just becomes much more obvious so if i sustain a speaking sound under perhaps a, a heightened emotion no does that become singing? or? I think it gets a lot closer to singing, yes, because you've got the sustain. I think the difference between singing and speaking is really how much you sustain that pitch and how identifiable the pitch is. I think it's very interesting. I think, um, to be honest, the, the way that actors are using their voices has changed since, for instance, uh, Victorian times, where it was very much more about intonation and declamation and the heightened emotion type of speaking that you were talking about. There seems to be such a huge psychological, if not physiological, gap. I think you've, you've hinted that the, the same physiology is at work, but psychologically, people make such a distinction. Everybody speaks, everybody can speak, but lots of people claim not to be able to sing. So why is that? 
Mm, that's very interesting, actually. I just kind of want to take a slight diversion, but it is relevant, and talk about the idea of tone of voice. Uh, so, for example, if I'm talking to Jeremy now and I want to just soothe him a bit because he's a little bit upset, <laughs> you can hear that I changed my tonal quality. Uh, on the other hand, if I was a little bit annoyed, then I, I might not only raise my voice, but go into a little bit of an angry, edgy sound. And I think that those are one of the ways in, in speaking that we reveal emotion, uh, aren't they? Because we could say the same sentence with different tones of voice. Now, once we get into singing, that is revealed much, much more. And I think that might be one of the reasons why people feel a bit afraid or they feel exposed in singing as opposed to speaking. Yeah, if you think about the differences between speaking something and singing something, there are several differences. They're not physiological particularly, but you do have to sustain pitch. You have to hit particular notes, and that's a completely different thing from rehearsing a speech. Mm. Uh, usually when you sing, the notes are predetermined. I think social singing has declined in, in popularity and ability. I, I go to so many birthday parties... And, mm. and when the crowd breaks into happy birthday, it's there's 17 different <laughs> melodies going on. <laughs> yeah. It can be a little bit abysmal. That leads us on to the concept of tone deaf. You know, you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you know, yeah. someone mm -hmm. says. And I've heard people in your line of work absolutely deny the existence of what we call tone deaf. So is it is it real or is it something that everybody should be able to learn to carry a tune? I think we need to separate real tone deafness from being unused to pitching because approximately 4% of the population are amusic and amusia is a, it's a cognitive condition. It's a cognitive condition. It's a little like dyslexia in that people are unable to recognize different pitches. So that does exist. Mm. There has been a little bit of research on getting diagnosed amusics to get closer to pitch matching. But most people who think of themselves as tone deaf or unable to sing are really stuck in one of the four stages of pitch matching. Yeah, they have either poor pitch production, which is sort of, if you're thinking about the mechanics of singing, or as Jeremy said, the, the poor pitch matching. And people who say they're tone deaf, they've nearly always given themselves this label. Mm. So, what are the, uh, so what are the other two steps that you... Okay, the first step is, this is from Graham Welch's research on um, stages of pitch matching in children. The first one is interest in words and rhythm, so the chanting comes in, but it's a very restricted pitch range. I mean, you could say that rap falls into that. Okay. So able to follow falling melodic patterns, but not a big pitch range, but your rhythm and your words are really good. Mm. Uh, stage two is able to control your melodic patterns more consciously so you get a bigger pitch range, you start to hear that there's a key in the music, the, the, the notes seem to relate to each other, um, but there's still some errors and it still falls off. Yeah, so if you're listening to your, you know, your party people singing happy birthday, by the time you get to the third line and there's that, that big leap, half of them will change key. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday to... That's the one. Yeah, yeah, they won't make that one, so they'll change key. I mean, the interesting thing about that is they recognise that it's a big interval. They're just not quite sure what the interval is. Mm -hmm. Stage three is everything increases in accuracy, but what might happen is that while they sing one phrase in, in the correct key, when they start the next phrase, they change key. Mm. So the notes are all relative to each other correctly in a sentence, but when they change sentence... They're all correct to each other, but not to the previous sentence. So that would go be, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, right? Absolutely, yeah, yes. Absolutely right. And yes. then stage four is, is everything seems to work. I was just thinking, I was wondering if tonal languages, if the speakers of tonal languages are any more reliable in, in singing, in, in recognizing pitches or acquiring those four abilities? I read something about this a couple of days ago. I think amusia is less prevalent in tonal language uh, speakers because to tonal tones are so important. You can say the same word, but if it has a different pitch or a different intonation, it has a different meaning. Exactly. Yeah, in, in the English language, we don't tend to do that. We do have meaning in, in prosody, but they're not completely different words. Yes, and Jill Gillian, you, re you re referred to that by adding the meaning of soothing or chastising obviously we, mm. we can recognize those melodies so we add meaning but we don't change the semantic meaning of a yes. word by by changing pitch 
I would think it's likely that they have more ability within their culture. I suspect that they probably develop their musical ability earlier than Western singers, but I'd, I'd have to check that out. Mm-hmm. Could I go back to the question of sustaining a note? And I flashed back to my, you know, I, I'm not a singer, uh, but I'm a, I call myself a, an actor who can sing. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've played Henry Higgins a couple of times, and that's, of course, a role that uh, that you can get away with not being able to sustain or, you know, be, have a bel canto voice by any means. And mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of Henry Higgins is is speaking, and you sort of morph from speaking into singing and back again. Look at her, a prisoner of the gutter. Condemned by every syllable she utters, you know, and, and sometimes the lyrics, the, the, the book says sings, and sometimes the book says speaks. So, uh, well, you'd be surprised how much we use speaking on pitch to get our people to sing. Speaking on pitch is really, really useful, and you've just demonstrated it beautifully. So, um, if I count to ten, and I just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I'm still changing pitch. If you then elongate the vowels, which is one of the biggest differences between speaking and singing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's much closer to singing. Yes, and even someone, so, who, even someone who's bad at the intervals can, yes. can still do that. Yes. Mm. I think um, we talked earlier about the, uh, it's almost like the disintegration, it's the decay in speaking, which you can do decay in terms of volume, but you also do it in terms of pitch. So if I didn't go for sing- speaking on pitch, it would be one, two, three, four, five. You start to change the pitch because you're, you've got a particular shape or a prosody in mind. Rather than the the pitch decay, or the volume decay, you just sustain a little longer. So for an exercise, uh, for somebody who isn't used to speaking, I might do speak, sustain, and then sustain pitch. So you do one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And we're much closer to singing because you are now sustaining both volume and pitch. Right, right. Let me play that Henry Irving recording. Henry Irving from 1898, a very early recording. You referred to the difference in speaking style, particularly with among actors in the classics. So I'm going yes. to play a little bit of this very rare Sir Henry Irving recording and get you to comment on what you hear going on. Now is the winter of our discontent. Be joyous summer, by this gentle dog. So that was Sir Henry Irving doing a little bit of uh, of Richard the Third. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, and he kind of almost sings it. What do you think? Very much, yes. Uh, it's much more sustained than you would probably use today. So if I was to talk to you in the sort of voice that he's using, and then I just sustain it a little more... You're actually straight into singing. Yes. And, and didn't you listen to the first section and you decided it was an octave and a semitone? He's, he's speaking over an octave and a semitone in the first section, which is roughly... Um, from that note to that note. So if I was to speak to you on that note, this is what he's doing. And then he goes up to here, so it's quite an extended pitch range. But Jeremy, you're doing something else as well. And Paul, you also did it, uh, which is that there's a kind of shaping in the vocal tract. There is. So I I'm, think of myself as talking to you in my, my normal voice, Paul. But if I was to match the shaping that you and Jeremy were doing in your vocal tracts, then it kind of has a little bit of a sort of a moan or a complaining feeling to it. And that's something that we associate quite a lot with singing, certainly yeah. in, in kind of more classical genres. Yeah. So interesting. In fact, even to this day, in teaching Shakespeare performance, I allege and encourage the concept of a three-octave range. Mm. from the uh, lowest growl to the highest squeak to yep. reveal the architecture of the argument. Yep. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer. You know, by going from winter to summer, you get the antithesis between winter and summer. Yes. So it's e- even in today's more naturalistic or less intoned or less chanted Shakespeare style, there's still the possibility of amazing 
range of pitch. Yes, and I love the idea that actors have a wide range of pitch that they can access. I mean, we use pitch, as human beings, we use pitch for emotion, for emphasis, to display, to communicate. We use, in fact, all sorts of things that we use. <laughs> yes. I want to pick up actually on something that you've said here, Paul, about revealing the architecture of the argument. I think one of the things that music does for speech is that it kind of sets out that subtext. And if you think, you know, in particular of someone like Sondheim and the way that he set the notes, although he might follow speech patterns, what's going on underneath in the harmonies and also the way that maybe he's constructed the melody always gives us other information about what is being conveyed in the song. And I think it's, you know, I often say to my my own clients, music reaches places where speech cannot go. I suppose that illustrates the familiar dictum that when you can no longer express what you wish to express in the spoken word, you must sing. And so Mm -hmm. that you launch into song, you break into song because you must. Yeah. And I'll go one stage further, which is when you're singing and the emotion gets so heightened, you launch into a cadenza or a riff, which is wordless. Hmm. How interesting. I'd never heard that concept. That's wonderful. Mm. Would this be a good time to play a little Sweeney Todd, a little mm. Johnny Depp Perfect. singing Perfect. Pretty, pretty Women? Pretty women, fascinating, sipping coffee. Dancing pretty women are a wonder. Pretty women sitting in the window or standing on the stair. It's a wonderful song, isn't it? Mm. But, Such a lovely example. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult melody to remember. It is. One of the ways that we get people to do this is, to, again, to follow the shape of the melody, but still in speaking voice. So this is actually where some actors fall over because they want they want to give their reading. They want of, to inflect how yeah. they feel it. And unfortunately, they can't. And because Sondheim has dictated it the way he wants it. He's already written it. And also, you are usually singing along to an instrument accompanying you. So if you look at the opening of that song, we have... Pretty women, fascinating, sipping coffee, dancing, pretty women, are a wonder. Hmm. Pretty women. I'm roughly following the shape of the melody. Right. So, Sondheim, just to be clear for us non-singers, was his, is his intention to mimic speech intonation in his melodies? I think mostly it is, yes. Most of the time, it follows approximately a speech pattern. I think it's something that makes his musical theatre writing quite distinctive. Others have followed on from that. Yeah, but with Sondheim, you always know that it's text first, voice second. Yes. Or text first, melody second. Whereas if you think about, you know, some of the wonderful melodies of Burt Baccarat and people like that, it's um, the lyrics are important, but... There's that sense, there's, you know, that the rhythm and the melody and are the also more important and that creating a vibe or a mood. Mm. So it's a very different uh, purpose of song, if you like. Yes. I've occasionally coached opera from mm. the dialect point of view and the diction point of view. Uh, not something I do a, a great deal, but I, I always instinctively insist that the words are interpreted, <laughs> that the, <laughs> the, the story be told through the words instead of just... The, the melody that uh, you know, often you cannot hear the words or understand the words as if they're secondarily important. I, d- I don't attend a lot of opera, but has that changed in recent years that, that people are doing a better job of, of honouring the text? Yes and no. I mean, what you've got to remember with opera is that it's very much voice production and sound based. And it has to be because you are um, usually not amplified and you have a hundred piece orchestra banging and scraping away in front of you. Um, so you have to cut through that. So it's very much about projection. 
And also with most opera writing, you are singing much slower than you would speak. So this is where sustain, particularly if you're in Puccini, Verdi and the 19th century composers, the sustain of that sound is much, much longer and much bigger than you would do in speaking voice. And that's a technical issue. I mean, you would think, wouldn't you, that musical theatre and opera, both being theatrical sung genres, would have a lot in common but in fact i think opera is a different beast mm. Mm. and i think the you know the intention of it the the sort of emotional architecture of the music is paramount mm. and beauty of voice always overrides intelligibility whereas in musical theater what we're aiming for is kind of much more moment by moment intelligibility mm. Mm. so that the audience engages in a different way i think if you go to reviews and you see what people are criticized for in opera, you can be criticised for not sounding right. It's very rare that you are criticised for not sounding right in theatre. Yes. Good point. I always like to go to the cracks. It's like, um, what, what don't people like? What are they criticised for? Where are the joins? And you usually find out more about the genre when you, when you look at the joins. Where should we go from here? I'll tell you what, somewhere I'd like to go. Um, I want to go back to Pretty Women. Because one of the things that singing in general uses much more than speaking is vibrato right when we were listening to uh, sir henry irving i hear vibrato in that sound and if you listen to some of his other recordings on youtube there is quite a lot of vibrato in what he's saying which is very interesting right that's the one piece of singing that i've always been weak at myself i can i can carry a tune mm. but i it's hard for me to trick vibrato into my voice perhaps i can do it when i'm speaking i maybe check me out let me be a client okay put me through an exercise that is chasing my vibrato okay we can use the um the richard the third speech okay but i want you to moan your way through it okay now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of york and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean Buried. Very good. Is that, um, is that Moni? I love that, that you still made the text work, Paul. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was very good. We're loving you moaning. Um, <laughs> let me give you a slightly different instruction. Okay. The difficulty is, this is just words. People have different emotional reactions to words. If I said to you, um, complain rather than moan. So the, um, the difficulty with moaning when you do it is that you're cutting out the sound slightly and we need sustained sound. Okay. Now is the winter, so it's it's much more sustained. But gonna, Jeremy, and it, you're is a, it is a complaining speech too. Yes it, yes, it is a complaining. Jeremy is almost in lament mode. Yes, you know, like the kind of very comedic. Whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa is me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's almost keening, isn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'll complain rather than moan. Okay. Yeah. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that loud upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. <laughs> did, I not, did I complain? I think you I did. Complained. You complained you very did. well. That's yes. pretty good. What is interesting is if you hold that shape setup that you're in and you sustain a sound, there's a little extra trick that you can do. Okay. So if you sustain a note with that sound yes. and then you back off very slightly, hmm. that's the best instruction I can give you. Yeah. Okay. Shall I give it a try? Yes. Do you want me to sustain words or yeah. just pure just, tone? Um, yeah. Start with the words so that you're used to that setup and then sustain a tone. Okay, okay. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Okay. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Now is the winter. Now. Ooh, something happened. Yeah. Yeah, yes. it did. Now is oh my! <laughs> now is the winter. <laughs> this is fun. Now is the winter of our discontent. Made glorious up. Now I'm being Kenneth Williams or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now is the winter of our discontent. Made glorious summer by the sun of York. And all the clouds. I'm, I'm, I'm vibrating, aren't I? You are. You vibrating. Are. I love it. <laughs> New word. <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually, I, you know, I'm going to go back to this emotion thing, Paul, because, you know, you've talked about the psychological uh, as well as the physiological differences. That 
we use that kind of tone when we get very emotional. So, you know, if, if we're having a, a heated debate with someone, then we might go, no, I don't want you to do that. Why did you do that? That's just so wrong. And what we have there is almost a crying thing going on. I'm using the same um, physiological setup, if you like, that you just used when you sustained. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for the lesson. You're welcome. Sheila Chandra? Sheila Chandra. Why not? I Extraordinary. Woman. I yeah. have several of her CDs. Let's play the little bit that you sent me. So this is Sheila Chandra from her Speaking in Tongues 3. I think she is amazing. That is marvellous. It's stunning, isn't it? So what would, so you, this, what would you say about it? This is Kona Kol, um, which is vocal percussion in Indian Carnatic singing. So this is specifically geared towards vocal percussion and it's rhythmic singing. I mean, it's incredibly rhythmic. That's the first thing. Yeah. I think what's interesting about it is that although she's not sustaining pitch, because of the way she's shaping the vowels and some of the consonants, you can still hear pitch, can't you? Oh, yes, but not mm. melody particularly. No. Well, not melody as we know it, Jim. <laughs> right. So is is that, again, because of the rhythm that puts it closer to singing then? Is that what you're... She could have done that whole sequence on one note or on a monotone or on a, a very narrow pitch range. But what she's doing is she's covering about an octave and a half, mm. which is quite a big speaking range. And you hear that there are certain... Uh, she does drop at the end of each phrase. But there so are there's, contours. There are contours. Hear, yeah. There are musical elements to it, yes. Mm. Mm. Shall I play that other piece that you sent me this morning? Yes. <laughs> Jeremy found this, Paul. Should we set this up before you play it? Yes. This is James Charles. James Charles is a YouTube sensation with 15 million subscribers. And there's, a, there's been a big argument recently uh, between several makeup artists. And he issued this apology. And the original is just him speaking. And there is a brilliant guy, Charles Cornell, who's a jazz pianist, who took his original YouTube video speaking track and set it to music. Hello, James here. I wish that I could say this was the last time that I would make a mistake. I won't be. I have a long way to go. <laughs> Very long way to go. I'm going to keep trying my best and keep learning and growing. Um, and be the best person that I possibly can be. I'm sorry. In regards to the boy situation, um, this is a conversation that I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with. And I'm not doing that today. I'm sorry. It's priceless, isn't it? It is. What's your take on this? <laughs> what does this well, have to do with what we're talking about? The thing is that um, James Charles, even though he doesn't realise it, he's actually using pitch in obviously in his in his apology. And because it is actually quite extreme what he's doing. The pianist, Charles Cornell, has just picked up on what pitches he's doing and has put jazz chords underneath it, and it's absolutely brilliant. If he was sustaining more, we would hear it as singing. Yeah. So again, it's kind of drawing those links, isn't it, uh, Jeremy, about the, where, where are the overlaps and where are the boundaries between singing and speaking? Yes. So can you take one of his phrases and, and repeat it several times, going further and further towards singing? Sure. It's something like... James here, I wish I could say that this was the last time I'd made a mistake. I wish I could say that this was the last time I'd made a mistake. Yeah, I hear you doing it. Yeah, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> it's almost Sondheim. <laughs> it is. There are a lot of uh, musical theatre composers that have been writing in the last five or six years or ten years that have been using this type of thing where they almost set people's speaking patterns to music. Once you recognise that, it actually makes them very easy to sing. Because all you really need to do is to speak in the rhythm that's written, and then you find out what the shapes are, and then those songs become really easy to do. Mm. Let's try something crazy. I'll come up with a sentence, and you start to set it to rhythm and music. Make a sun time out of me. So let, okay. So here comes here comes a phrase. Okay. I really wish you'd just let me alone. 
I really wish you'd just let me alone. Okay. I really wish you'd just let me alone. I really wish you'd just let me alone. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. Can you remember the melody you used? I really wish you'd just let me alone. And it's a melody that absolutely is faithful to the intentionality and the uh, the shape of the argument grammatically. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if I, I slow, I'm slowing it down in order to get the notes, but if I then speed it up again, so I really wish you just let me alone. I really wish you just let me alone. Yeah. yeah. And it's going through a ninth. It's actually an octave and a half. You're kidding. No, it's wow. something like uh, high C to low G. Mm. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Let's listen. How about this laughing sequence that you gave me? You like? Mm. Should we go there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Set this up for us. This is again somebody very clever has taken a very famous laugh. It's Kathy Jetson. She's a singer, isn't she? I think. And they obviously played the recording, and they've transcribed the notes and the rhythm that she's singing, this, that she's laughing in, and turned it into a piece of music. So in theory, anybody could read those notes and laugh in exactly the same way. Do you know what's so interesting about that? We are all laughing, and oh. laughing, is, laughing contagious. is contagious. It is infectious, mm -hmm. and all cultures laugh. Yeah. Even chimpanzees laugh. <laughs> what's that musical notation towards the end when she was doing that? There was, oh, there was, those... a, there was some notes. There was some yes. diacritics over the notes. Those are that's a, semi a creak, semi no semi quaver triplets. <laughs> that. <laughs> And then you go, ha, 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 They're triplet signs. Mm. <laughs> that. Oh, you're right. They do look like diacritics, Paul, but I think they're just um, rather yeah. messy threes. Groups of three. Yeah. Okay. okay. And for our listeners, if you want to see the musical transcription, just Google Kathy Jensen's signature laugh transcribed. Kathy Jensen's signature laugh transcribed. And actually, the reason why I, I'm very taken with this is because although the kind of the way you're breathing for laughing is not as controlled as you need for singing or even speaking, it's one of those, you know, we, we learn to laugh with our, our carers between about six and eight weeks of age. And, uh, you know, we're responding and we're bonding. It's a really important aspect. That's very early, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Um, it's a really important aspect of human communication. And of course, she's using a massive pitch range mm. there. So a lot of the things that we do in singing and actually that you're talking about in expect, you know, an extended speaking voice, mm. we've got all the, th those, you know, laughing, crying, moaning, all of the wailing sounds. We're already doing those as babies, and it's what we're doing is we're culturing it, if you like, in singing. Mm. Can you sing in a whisper? It depends what type of whisper it is. It is. If it's unvoiced, no, you can't. So if it's an unvoiced whisper, there's no singing here because there's no voicing. No. So the vocal folds aren't vibrating. Right. But I, I'm flashing back on the thing that I learned in drama school, uh, the resonator scale. When I go uh, through all of the cardinal vowels and listening to the the fundamental, I guess it's the fundamental pitch of each vowel from, so the resonator scale goes something like this. Yeah, that's the uh, Clifford Turner exercise, it's, isn't it? It's, it's the Clifford Turner exercise. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's happening there, obviously, we haven't we haven't got a true fundamental in, in the sense of thinking no. about acoustics of voice because there's no sound source. Right. But all vowels, because we make different shapes in, in, the, in the mouth with our vowels, they, they have uh, bandwidths of resonance. And what you're hearing are you're hearing those bandwidths of resonance as a pitch. So they're sort of acting as a fundamental. So you're, what you're listening to is resonance. Mm. Okay. So these are the resonance shapes that we hold, or some of the resonance shapes that we hold when we're speaking and singing. Mm. And you're, you're isolating those shapes, but without voicing. 
So what are the lessons from the resonator scale that come to your mind as singers? Can they help actors? Can they help public speakers in terms of increasing expressivity? Mm. Um, we're playing a lot at the moment with um, vowel tuning. I mean, each vowel has its own timbre or colour, if you like, which which we do hear as a kind of note. Mm. And you can sort of let vowels borrow from each other uh, to colour your overall sound. Uh, for instance, we experience oo as being warmer and darker, and we experience e as being, you know, brighter and uh, more edgy sometimes. And we can use those to play with our resonance in essence what we're doing um when we're playing with pitch and we'll give you a demonstration in a minute what we're doing when we're playing with vowel tuning is we're shifting the point of focus in the vowel chart up and down backwards and forwards um so if i take pretty women i'm still going to sing all the words for pretty women but i'm going to hold a slightly different vowel shape for a couple of versions so that you can hear what it does to the singing so if i hold my standard one which is i Pretty women, fascinating. And then I hold an air. Pretty women, fascinating. And I hold an or. Pretty women, fascinating. Changes the sound I'm making. It does, doesn't it? Completely. Mm. And you've gone from a, a high front vowel to a, a low back vowel, in fact. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you've gone from E so, to O. Isn't it astonishing that we still understand the words that the Sondheim has written? But yes. We've actually changed the vowels. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. I mean, it makes me, th makes me think of the way we understand dog pronounced in many different dialects. We can go from dog to dog to dog to dog. And uh, we still understand that we're talking about man's best friend. But Absolutely, mm. yeah. Mm. It's such an interesting thing to play with because it's a very, very quick way of changing people's resonating shape um, for something that they might like to use or something that's completely wrong even for, for the genre. Point taken. Where do you want to go from here? Ah. <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> One of the things that we haven't, we've sort of mentioned it by in passing, and you mentioned it at the very beginning, which is pitch range. Mm. The interesting thing about Speaking pitch range, and I'm so glad that you talk about an extended pitch range because I think it is really important. When you are singing, you are mostly singing above your speaking pitch. Hmm. As a man or as a woman, you are mostly singing above your speaking pitch, particularly as a man. Um, because if you, even if I don't do that much extended range in my speaking voice, this is sort of where I'm sitting in my voice and it's about round about there on the note. And actually there are very few songs that are written down there. Most of them are written up here, which is an octave higher. Mm. So you t we, we talk about pitch centers, the center of a song. And normally in the singing voice in men, the pitch center is quite a lot higher than the speaking pitch center. And that's where we normally gravitate towards when we speak or when we sing, right? We Absolutely. Gr we gravitate if we're not given any particular instructions, if, we, if someone says sing, yeah. you're, go you're going to choose a note to start with that's above your normal speaking register. I think most songs are written above your normal speaking register. I think if you're, if, you're, if you're just asked to sing Happy Birthday, you will probably sit somewhere in the middle of your speaking comfort zone to start. But then if you think that Happy Birthday has an octave leap in it, yeah. Happy Birthday, I'm, ah, oh, immediately if I was to speak up there, that's really quite high in my speaking range. As you can hear, mm. we should mention the um, the oratorical tradition, perhaps in African American preachers. You 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 had suggested that we use the Martin Luther King "I Have a Dream" speech as an example of sp spoken language that is very very close to singing. But, yes. we've, but we've used that speech in several other podcasts. But but let's let's talk about about preaching, about sermonizing, about um, uh, scripture reading, about uh, those kinds of semi-formal speech, mm. speech acts that move speaking voice closer to song. What comes to mind when I put us into that zone? I go straight to Baptist minister. Um, funnily enough, I think I actually do think that this is denomination-led because if you're going to a standard Church of England minister in the uk it would be unusual to hear somebody delivering in the same manner as uh, martin luther king yeah even if they were outdoors this is i have my vicar voice dearly beloved we are gathered here together <laughs> yes. and it's yeah. very it is actually quite sing-song but it's very gentle 
and um, it really is designed to care for you. Um, whereas the Baptist minister is much more, uh, it's, it's much more sung. Funnily enough, you will often get vibrato in the speaking voice. Um, I'm going to back off the microphone a bit for this. Much more that this is the sort of thing that you'll get. So it's much more energised. The pitch range is much bigger and going from top to bottom very, very frequently. Obviously, if we're thinking about Martin Luther King, there was a, a well-written speech there and a very strong content. Mm. But there was also kind of really important emotional messaging going on there. Yes. And it seems to be that it, it's that that informs that, you know, that kind of oratorical speaking, yes. that it becomes to move your audience as well as to inform them. And if there's an imbalance between the intentionality or the emotion and the and the simple musical execution then we then we tend to deride it as yes. as affected but yes. we disbelieve it we disbelieve it so it, but if there's plenty of emotion informing those musical choices not yeah. that they're even choices in the first place but you know what i'm going there needs to be a balance doesn't there i would suspect that we could easily buy into a version of the uh, richard the 3rd done in the same musical way that Henry Irving did over mm. 100 years ago, mm. but it, with, with a sufficient amount of intentionality or emotional intelligence going on, it wouldn't strike us as old-fashioned or, or false or unbelievable. I agree. And I think the intention and the emotion, if they match, they actually become really important. It becomes the driver of the pitch. It's not the other way around. Yes. And of course, I, I work with public speakers all the time, I guess what I'm doing is moving them closer and closer towards things that are identifiably singing. Mm. I guess we should s start to kind of sum up a little bit. If I were to ask you to sum up what we've been talking about, what would you say? Differences between speaking, emotionally heightened speaking and singing, I think are important. Mm. Because emotionally heightened speaking carries a lot of the singing signature sounds. Singing just takes it a stage further. The musical element is the part that we learn in a different way from speaking, you know, preferably within our own culture, learning to sing with our parents, listening to music. Interesting that people not only sing together, but people sing on their own. Mm. They hum around the house. You know, why do we do that? Mm to express something or the other. So I think that kind of emotional expression, psychological expression element is also very important. And that links with music as well as the, uh, as Jeremy's talked about pitch and maybe kind of sense of key, key, you know, there's a musical structure that people can absorb without ever needing to read music. Mm. Now there's something in, in musical expression that we all respond to. Even if I'm feeling very down and blue, if I sing in the shower, it generates joy immediately. Yep. I mean, we, we know that when people sing in groups, they um, create more oxytocin in, in their blood. They feel more socially connected with other people. Their heart rates synchronize, mm. which is fascinating. I didn't know that. So singing's darn good for you. Absolutely. It definitely is. It's official. And... Musically expressive speaking, presumably, could be the, could fill almost the same role. Yep. It, it is. Oh, and I, I mean, this is just a, a random fact, you know, thinking about singing being good for you. But did you know that people with advanced dementia and Alzheimer's who can barely speak and string a sentence together can still sing? And in fact, can learn new songs, which is amazing. That is totally amazing. Isn't it phenomenal? Well, between the three of us, we're going to save the world, right? Absolutely. That's the plan. Thanks for joining me. And thanks to you for joining Gillian Kays, Jeremy Fisher and me, Paul Meyer. The fair use sound clips you heard in this month's podcast were from Sweeney Todd, written by Stephen Sondheim and John Logan, directed by Tim Burton, copyright DreamWorks, Parks, McDonald Productions and The Zanuck Company. And Speaking in Tongues 3 by Sheila Chandra, copyright Sheila Chandra and Real World Records. Join me next time when my guest will be Joan Hall, Director Emerita of the Dictionary of American Regional English, known as DARE. We'll be talking about DARE, of course, and its amazing work in cataloguing America's fast-changing dialects. If you want to know who uses the words crop-happy, flummadiddle, 
catawampus and mully grubs and where those people live tune in next time to in a manner of speaking <laughs>